This is Ling270, Language, Technology, and Society, Module 3, Decipherment. In this lesson, we'll talk about the decipherment of the Linear B writing system. So uh, the tablet up uh, in this picture here is an example of what the Linear B writing system looked like. Uh, it was a, uh, a writing system found in uh, artifacts, uh, mostly found on the island of Crete, but also in other areas of, uh, of ancient Greece. Um, uh, and archaeologists concluded that this was a writing system that was used prior to the development of the uh, of the Greek alphabet. Um, so um, now people weren't sure initially as to what language uh, uh, this writing system represented. Uh, it was only later confirmed that this uh, writing system represented uh, Greek. Um, but so um, because of that, uh, a process of decipherment had to take place to find out what these symbols uh, represent. Um, so a really important figure in the decipherment of Linear B was uh, the archaeologist Alice Kober. Um, and uh, she was, uh, her very important contribution was her statistical analysis. Uh, so she collected as many Linear B symbols as she could, um, which amounted to over a, uh, 180,000 symbols from uh, various ar uh, artifacts found uh, in, uh, in Greece. Um, and uh, 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 Kober's analysis was largely uh, looking through these sets of symbols and finding out what kind of commonalities there might be. Um, and Kober was, uh, was notable that uh, she found many repeating triplets, as she called them. There are a lot of set of symbols, which uh, pairs of, of three, uh, which uh, tend to occur uh, together very frequently. Um, and, but she also noticed that a lot of these triplets tend to change at their endings. Um, and that kind of gives an indication as to what kind of language we're, uh, we're dealing with. Um, so, um, so since the endings of these uh, sets of symbols change, uh, this kind of gives an indication that this is a, a language with inflectional morphology. Uh, in other words, yeah, the, um, the word uh, changes its form, especially its ending, depending on its grammatical function. Um, and not all languages are like this, uh, inflectional morphology uh, is uh, common in languages like uh, Greek and many other European languages. Um, you won't find it as much in languages like Chinese or Vietnamese, which uh, don't use inflectional uh, morphology. So, uh, so this gives kind of a good indication that the language that these symbols represent is, a, a, is ancient Greek, or at least a predecessor of ancient Greek. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, uh, however, when uh, although these endings of these triplets uh, changes, uh, the symbol in the middle changes. So I've highlighted uh, those uh, how those symbols change um, in uh, figure 415 up there from our textbook. Um, and what uh, Kober uh, concluded was that this is where uh, the ending of a word crosses a syllable boundary. Um, so to give an example of what this kind of thing looks like uh, in, uh, in English, um, if we have uh, uh, something like the word Canada uh, and we uh, change that word to, to mean, uh, to refer to a person from Canada, we would say Canadian. Uh, and the third sil a symbol uh, or syllable in Canadian is D, whereas the third syllable of Canada is da. Um, so if we made a writing system for English where each symbol represented a, a syllable, that syllable in the middle would have to change from da to D. So she made the assumption that this kind of process was happening uh, in, in linear B. Um, and that kind of information uh, was very helpful uh, to, to uh, indicate that linear B is a syllabary. And uh, these kinds of correspondences can, uh, can tell us information about uh, what these, uh, these uh, symbols have in common. So, um, so for example, if we see that um, uh, these, uh, these symbols, these highlighted symbols tend to change, they probably have the same initial sound, but they only change their vowel depending on the vowel of the inflectional ending. And I'll, I'll show some examples of, of what these uh, uh, symbols actually um, represent in terms of sounds. Um, so uh, by the time the decipherment of linear B had been completed a few years later, we know now that these uh, symbols on the left represent rukito, rukitiyo, and rukitiya. So that's what these symbols represent in, uh, in the first uh, column. And we can see that the highlighted symbol changes from representing to to t. 
Um, yeah. I am the column on the right, um, the, uh, the decipherment, um, once it had been completed, uh, can tell us that these uh, symbols were pronounced aminiso, aminisio, and aminisia. So the, the so changes to si in the other two um, uh, words uh, here. Now, um, uh, now as, I, as we, uh, you may have noticed in the, um, the earlier decipherments that we've talked about, starting with names is very important for, for undergoing a decipherment because they tend to stay the same over time and they tend to be very similar in different languages. Uh, and we know that there are two cities in, in Crete called Luktos and Amnisos. Um, so um, decipherers of linear B assume that these uh, sets of symbols are kind of trying to approximate those, uh, those sounds here. Um, and also that, that these eo and ia suffixes are, um, are added to a place name and they refer to a, uh, to a resident of that place. Um, so in the same way that we take Canada and turn it to Canadian, going from uh, luctos to um, uh, luctio, that, that means a person from luctos or a male person from luctos. And luctia, that would mean uh, a female person from luctos. Um, so, um, and these kinds of, of patterns are very similar to the inflectional morphology that we find in ancient uh, Greek. So that kind of gives further evidence that this is the right course of, of decipherment. We also talked in the textbook about the contributions of the uh, archeologist, Michael Ventris. And Ventris was uh, famous for uh, making a, uh, a wooden table where the various linear B symbols could be uh, arranged. Now the, the table, each row of the table would represent what consonant those symbols begin with, uh, since these are symbols of a syllabary, and each column would represent which vowel that um, would be in each of those uh, syllable. Um, so, um, so yeah, he designed this kind of, of table, and he used a lot of Cobra's findings to group the similar syllables together. So as I uh, show, had shown in the previous slides, we can look to see where the inflectional endings of a, a word might change uh, and use that to see which um, uh, syllable symbols tend to have the same uh, initial sound. Now, um, Ventus made a pretty big mistake though when he was trying to do the decipherment. Uh, he made the assumption that the language which um, uh, these symbols represented couldn't have been ancient Greek because right, th these were, this is an entirely different writing system. This might be, have been a, a civilization that was completely different from uh, the ancient Greeks, which we, uh, we know about from other archeological sources. So he assumed that, that these symbols must represent some other language. And the language that he assumed that it would represent was Etruscan, a, a language spoken in uh, Italy at the time uh, during the period of the, um, the early Roman empire. Um, now this was not the uh, correct um, uh, response uh, because uh, if, since Ventris made this uh, initial um, hypothesis, he was not able to get very far with it. The decipherment didn't really make sense when you, if you uh, assume that the underlying language is uh, Etruscan. Um, and because of this, we know now that Ventris was only able to correctly identify five out of the 81 symbols correctly. Um, uh, and the <coughs> decipherment was really only able to be successful once uh, it was concluded that linear B represented a, an ancestor language of Greek. And once that happened, the, the decipherment started to make much more sense. So, uh, so yeah, the, the, the finding of later uh, research, which uh, Ventris later changed his assumption that uh, linear B represents Etruscan uh, to <clears throat> the fact that uh, um, linear B represents an ancestor of, of the Greek language. So once he, um, so yeah, now he, he changed the assumption and th things started to make much more sense. Um, and uh, now what we can notice is that there is a lot of uh, some kinds of acrophonic um, uh, principles being used here. So take a look at the example for the word uh, tripod. We can see that the word tripod is represented by the syllables ti ri po de. Um, and we can see that the first uh, symbol of tripod, ti, 
is a picture of a thing with three legs, exactly like a kind of tripod. So we can see that the, the acrophonic principle is kind of being uh, used here. Yeah. Um, and uh, now the, uh, so as I talked about with the Babylonian decipherment, the way to, uh, to um, ensure that your decipherment is really correct is to use a process of independent verification. So that means applying your, uh, comparing your decipherment to uh, other uh, decipherment work which um, you have not seen before, or to apply your decipherment to artifacts which you have never seen before. So maybe your decipherment works really well for the artifact that you've been working on, but if you apply that same decipherment to a new artifact and it doesn't make any sense, that's probably a sign that your decipherment is not correct. Um, so it, this an opportunity to confirm whether uh, the work of Cobra and Ventress was correct or not came in 1953 when there were a, was a large discovery of new tablets with linear B inscriptions. Um, and these uh, new tablets were very easily decipherable. And that gave the indication that this assumption that linear B represents Mycenaean Greek and that it's the syllabary and how each of these syllabaries represents each of these sounds, uh, that it showed that all those assumptions were all uh, very likely uh, correct. And it was also found that these tablets were on the Greek mainland, not just in Crete where they had initially uh, been uh, found. Um, so, so based on that kind of evidence, we can conclude that linear B uh, most likely was used to represent a predecessor of ancient Greek.